My name is Blake Hargreaves, and this is Future Stops. The music you hear is our feature piece for this episode, a work by French composer Olivier Messiaen, recorded in 2011 at the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris by Olivier Latry, the cathedral's titular organist. We'll hear more of this piece later and speak to Monsieur Latry himself about the tragic fire at the cathedral in 2019, which burned the roof off this famous cultural landmark. The whole world watched as what is arguably the most recognizable pipe organ anywhere was threatened by the fire. I remember watching the images of the fire in Victoria, BC, and realizing I had had a premonitory dream about a burning wooden building that morning before hearing the news. This instrument is clearly living in the subconscious of many of us who care about pipe organs. So with our first episode of Future Stops, we're going to look into the restoration process and learn about some of the many reasons for this pipe organ's reputation. I'll be speaking with Notre Dame's titular organist Olivier Latry, but first, organ builder Bertrand Catio, who is involved in the reconstruction and has had as much experience with this instrument as anyone alive today tells me about the current state of the organ and the extent of the damage done in the fire. And effectively, I could say, well, everything is preserved, except there's a lot of dust all over the organ. And the problem of this dust is it's full of lead. And we were concerned to know what could be the uh, action of this dust on the pipes, wood or metal and some uh, analyses were done and there's no problem, no risk of any uh, corrosion or something like that. The only problem is that lead is bad for health. So now we have to be really protected when we work in the organ with a special um, assistance for uh, breathing. So the conditions of work are quite hard. So there are 10 people and with two, two teams because we cannot work more than five hours a day with this problem of uh, breathing assistance. So now we begin the dismantling of the organ, so take off every pipe. They will be um, installed in boxes very carefully and then we take off all the chest because you must know that for one year and a half uh, inside the cathedral it's almost like outside because there are big holes in the vault so the temperature, the humidity, the dryness goes inside like it is outside so the chest must be restored. Then we take off some blowers but we keep in Notre Dame, we keep the case, the four big blowers, the big uh, wooden 32 pipes, because they are too big to go out, and the front pipes will remain in place, because the front pipes are very uh, fragile, so we prefer to keep them here, so they won't be removed. And then after, there will be the bidding for decontamination, restoration, rebuilding, and voicing. Olivia Latry was out of the country when he heard the news of the fire and could only watch the images of it from afar. It wasn't until hours later he was able to get a hold of someone who could inform him of the state of the organ. Uh, the, the manager of Notre Dame went to the organ loft and uh, we spoke on the phone and because I was in Vienna at that time. And he told me, you know, it seems I am in the organ, everything uh, seems absolutely normal. Because there were uh, several uh, dangers. The first is, of course, that the organ could burn totally. Then the second thing is that the organ would not support the heat, and then the, the pipes would just, you know, uh, be uh, deformed. And, and then the third danger was the firemen with the, the water. And uh, there were just a few pipes uh, in the substitute food who got some water. And that's it. Nothing else. No heat, no fire. Isn't it a miracle? 
Oh, I was in Switzerland voicing a new organ in Switzerland, and of course I was, uh, like everybody, completely destroyed, especially because I come in Notre Dame since 48 years now, so I know a lot about the organ and the building, of course. It was really a torture to see that. But now there's a big work, all this team, a lot of people working in to save Notre Dame with a very phenomenal spirit and hopefully it's uh, energizing and everybody goes in the same direction and it's a good thing to see this um, spirit around Notre Dame. That spirit is evident as I walk around the outside of the cathedral, which is barricaded with high metal walls as the decontamination and reconstruction takes place. I remember that spirit in the days immediately after the fire, when there was an outpouring of support from all around the world for this famous building. Like the building itself, the pipe organ has a fascinating history of being built and rebuilt, added to and refined, growing and maturing through the centuries. Uh, let's speak, for example, about for me, the best organ of the world, <laughs> uh, the, the cathedral in Poitiers, which is an organ which hasn't been changed since the, the 18th century. So, and it's just a miracle when you play one chord, even one chord on any stop. You know, it's just, a, you, are, you think it's a dream. You say, how is it possible to arrive at that level of perfection? But in that case, the organ is unique and was made by one man, or of course, a team. And these organs are, have a, a big coherence by themselves. They have a, a big historicity. I don't know if it, this word, works, uh, word exists in, in, uh, in English, but, uh, uh, well, we, we feel the, uh, the history, history where everything sounds so evident with the instrument. Uh, at Notre Dame, it's... It's not the same case because the organ has been touched by so many organ builders. But because there are so many organ builders, it's more transcendental than all of those instruments. And this is what makes this organ so special. Yes, we could say it's an open book of the old French history of French organ building. Um, so it has been built in 1733 by Thierry originally. And uh, François-Henri Clicquot restored or uh, rebuilt it in uh, 1784, I think. Uh, made a new, new organ with the case. He added a new uh, positive, uh, rug positive case and a lot of new pipes. Kept some old pipes from Thierry and even older. In this organ, there are 10 pipes, which certainly come from the original Gothic organ, from the Gothic facade of the organ, so maybe from the 15th century. They are now in a stop on the pedal uh, division. So after uh, François-Henri Clicquot, uh, Dallery, Another organ builder in maybe 1830 made some changes. And when the cathedral was restored by uh, Violet Le Duc, the big arch architect, they decided to, to restore or rebuild the organ. So the work was uh, done by Aristide Cavalier in 1863. So Cavalier Cole. Uh, took off the positive case and built a completely new organ but kept most of the uh, Clicquot and ancient pipes, reused these pipes and added some new pipes but you have all the Clicquot organ still in the organ. So it was a completely new style organ made for romantic music of course. Uh, 
And in fact, I would say that uh, I tried to let the organ teach me. And I tried to listen to the organ, to what to, the organ had to tell me. And uh, this is from that time that I found all the qualities of the organ, just enormous, you know? Uh, because it's so, uh, it's so an incredible instrument where it's possible to do so many things. Uh, and, well, we, we have to thank Cavalli Cole to what he has done on the instrument also, because uh, all the experiments with the, uh, uh, the, the mutations, you know, with the Nazar, the Tiers, the Septim, and all of that, uh, in 8 foot, 16 foot, 32 foot, all the, the uh, reed chorus, like the clarinet, like the basson, like the, uh, uh, the reeds, big reeds on the on the, this manual, etc. Uh, everything is just exceptional. The flute harmonique. So it's, it's just a, an incredible world. And after Cavalier, till 1930, nothing was done. In 1930, uh, uh, the Gloton firm made some changes. Uh, Vierne wanted some. And the, in 1960, around 1960, Pierre Cochereau was the organist, and he decided to uh, electrify the organ. Key action mainly, and that was was done by uh, Jean Herman. And Jean Herman um, worked only two years, and he, he died. So Pierre Cochereau asked to Robert Boisseau from Poitiers, in the center of France, <coughs> to continue the work, and that's what he did. So they came back to a kind of neoclassical organ trying to re barocize you would say, the organ, but always keeping the pipes. They made some change on the voicing, but the pipes were still there. And this situation uh, went to 1990, something like that. And yes, 1990 was decided a big restoration which has not been done since 1863. So we did this restoration. I was working with Boisseau, Jean-Louis Boisseau at this moment. We had a, a firm named Boisseau Catio, and two other firms worked with us because it's a very big organ and they wanted the work done in three years. So we needed to be uh, more than only one firm, because in France there are not big firms that you can find in, in the States or in, in uh, Quebec or something like that. So this work was to change the electrification action, so that's where the um, electronic action was uh, installed for the first time, and trying to come back to more cavalier call uh, sound, but keeping some uh, clico sounds. So it was trying to balance the organ a little more, better than it was before. So that's what we did. And uh, so you can see that from the 18th century, there's always evolving, always, always. And uh, so in, we arrive in 2012 where the electronic action was uh, what we say in French obsolete that's a problem of the electronic so we were obliged to change that and the idea was to change uh, there was a division called Petite Pedale installed by Boisseau and this division was extended in a full compass uh, 56 knots division and this floating division. So you can play this division on any keyboard. I think that the organ of Notre Dame is in some ways the superlative organ. I don't know what you, if you understand what I mean, but in fact, 
in Notre Dame, we still have the fortissimo, the three F by Messiaen. But if we need to go further than that, uh, beyond that point, we can we can have a five F without any problem because the organ will be uh, uh, as loud as we want. And the same on the other way. Uh, if we need to have a pianissimo, pianissimo, then it will, won't be a problem to find a way to make a pianissimo. And of course, there is a big range of uh, nuances between this pianissimo and fortissimo. This organ has a lot of soul, and the soul is coming from all the, the, the souls of all the organ builder who worked in this instrument. Because from the, uh, especially from the 17th century, the organ was restored was restored maybe every 25 or 30 years. And each time, the, the organ builders who worked in the instrument kept most of the, of the pipes of the material uh, of the previous organ builders. That means that the organ is really quite versatile in some ways, although it is a real French organ. Uh, all the French music can sound very well there. Uh, all the, the Baroque music, for example, because we still have the reeds and the, and the plunger and all of that. But if you want to play, of course, the Vierne, the Vidor, the, the perfect organ for that. But also the French uh, uh, modern music. Uh, I'm thinking about Jean-Louis Florence or Thierry Esquèche, Messiaen, all of this repertoire uh, works absolutely well. So this is a real uh, French organ uh, from all over the time.
You're listening to the Future Stops podcast, an initiative of the Royal Canadian College of Organists. My name is Blake Hargreaves, and I'm your host as we explore the world of the 21st century organ. We just heard today's feature piece, L'Apparition de l'Église Éternelle, by French composer Olivier Messiaen, being performed by Monsieur Latry on the organ in Notre Dame back in 2011. The score of this work features a rare dynamic marking. The letter F, signifying forte or loud in a musical score, is usually written once or twice to indicate very loud. Messier placed no fewer than five Fs to mark the loudest moment of this piece. This is not something just any pipe organ can achieve, and the immense volume it can produce is part of what makes the organ at Notre Dame so legendary. You know what? There's a story with Pierre Cochereau. Um because uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, during the 70s, the, the Concorde, the plane, was not allowed to uh, land in New York because it was too noisy. And uh, Pierre Cochereau uh, wrote an article in some newspapers in France saying that uh, he will, it was the beginning of the uh, audition at Notre Dame for uh, all the concerts on Sunday afternoon where there were many American organists to came to play, uh, he said, I will just uh, avoid to invite uh, American organists now because the organ of Notre Dame is louder than the Concorde. And I don't, I don't want to destroy the, 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 uh, the, the ears of these poor uh, American organists. Making such a loud instrument sound musical requires the touch of a master at the art of voicing. Voicing is the individual manual adjustment of each of the 8,000 pipes to create a coherent sound throughout the organ, which in this case contains pipes handmade by multiple builders over multiple centuries. Bertrand Catio has a lot of experience voicing organs, including the most recent work done on the organ at Notre Dame in 2012. Well, voicing is uh, artistry, which is not the case of tuning. Tuning is physical. Uh, voicing is artistry. That's where you give a part of yourself, so you you have to uh, understand absolutely the acoustic of the room, understand what the musical ID you want to have. So in the case of Notre Dame, the musical ID is here. Uh, you just have to be guided by the pipes. You don't have to, to think, this pipe I want it to sound like this. Yeah. So we work on the toe hole, on the language, what we call the uh, lumière, I don't remember, uh, the space between the language and the lower lip can be changed, and the upper lip can be changed too. So we work on all this. When you, the voicer normally is not in the organ, he's at the desk, at the keyboard, and he's listening at the same time, the pipe and the acoustic. And you have to voice each pipe, but you have to think that they will blend all together. Or It's difficult to say more about uh, voicing. It's something sometimes which is over you. I don't know how to say that more, but uh, in kind of organ like Notre Dame, you have to be at the same time yourself, but humble, because your predecessors have done already a voicing and you must keep the idea and the spirit. I like this expression, it, which, uh, uh, so in French we say harmonist, not at all voicer. Voicer is not a nice word for me. Harmonist, it comes from harmony, that's more uh, deep. And uh, I could say the harmonist is uh, wind sculpture. You see what I mean? That's a good transcription. At this point, I wondered aloud if an instrument containing pipes from four centuries of builders and restorers felt a bit like a Frankenstein's monster. The reference was meant to be complimentary, but also addresses one of the main challenges to this restoration project. How to rebuild the structure while still maintaining the famous acoustic qualities. 
Efforts are being made to source the stone for rebuilding from the same quarry where it was obtained six centuries ago, but it will be a challenge for both the construction team and the organ makers to preserve the unique and magical sound of the organ at Notre Dame. In the case of Notre Dame, it's not really Frankenstein. It's, uh, I would say, uh, evolving, but so gently or so perfectly done that you can find a balance quite easily. Sometimes uh, I've been restoring organs where di with different periods where it was more scary than here in Notre Dame. Um, no, there's a, a magic part here in Notre Dame. It's a unique sound of the cathedral. The acoustic is really fantastic. And there's a really real blend, the organ, the music with the building. So one of the challenges here now is to be sure that we can find the same acoustic after the works, which will be done, than before. And we don't know, because some parts of the vault are felt. Of course, they will use the same materials, I think, but it's difficult to be sure that the acoustic will be exactly the same. And of course, dismantling the pipes, we, we will take care of everything, but when you move pipes, you change a little bit of the voicing. So that will be the big challenge of the voicer. Well, I hope I will be the voicer because I was the last one, and I have been uh, bringing some part of myself in this organ, so I hope I will be the voicer in three years because the idea now is to build, uh, to restore the organ for 2024. Due to the very dynamic experience of time that a lot of us are feeling right now in pandemic life, 2024 can seem like a long time to wait for the church to reopen, and of course simultaneously seem like a deadline charging at us with thundering speed. As such, we plan to check in on this restoration project on future episodes of the podcast. I especially would like to witness the voicing firsthand, as Monsieur Catio tells me he does this work purely by ear, without the use of computers or sound technology of any kind. Before the end of this, the first episode of the Future Stops podcast, I want to leave you with one more clip from my interview with Olivier Latry, where his passion for the pipe organ reflects how we hope to inspire you with this new project, Future Stops. Well, there are, there, there are so many things uh, possible with the instrument, with the organ. Because we always think that the organ is a church instrument, but it's just, well, it was more a like and profane instrument than a church instrument during two, uh, two, 20 centuries. There are so many things also possible in uh, so many ways. So the, the contemporary music is one way, of course, but uh, you can play something more on the... Uh, well, show business <laughs> or that kind of music. You can play some, the theater organ is also some kind of a instrument which is very interesting and you can make so many things. Also, uh, we have several projects like that in, uh, with music and dance or, or, or of course with different uh, groups of musicians, ensemble, etc. Everything is possible. And... Uh, what would, uh, for me, can attract also the, the audience is not only the, uh, the instrument itself, but the machine. Because it's so incredible to see an instrument like that. So you cannot visit uh, the, the, the inside of a violin, for example, but you can go inside, a, inside an organ and, and discover all of that. It's just uh, incredible. We completely agree and hope you'll join us as we venture inside this world. For those who are unable to walk into a pipe organ themselves, we want to bring you along on our adventures, interventions, and ascensions in the world of organ music past, present, and future. Thank you for joining us, and please subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. A new edition of Future Stops will be available every second Tuesday, and you can find bonus material, hidden gems, and secret worlds on our Facebook and Instagram accounts under Future Stops Podcast. Future Stops is a podcast from the Royal Canadian College of Organists, produced by Andrew O'Connor with Haley Raymond as community manager and executive producer Elizabeth Shannon. I'm your host, Blake Hargreaves. 
In the coming weeks on Future Stops, join us as we attend a 600-year-long organ performance and meet an extraordinary organist who responded to the pandemic by giving free concerts to the confined with an electronic pipe organ on the back of a flatbed truck. Until then, let us know what stories you'd like to hear on Future Stops, keeping an appropriate amount of distance, of course, and thanks again for listening.